there's a lot to think about when we look at this text today, when we talk about going back across the Jordan. Today we will close out with these last three verses of chapter 10 and setting the stage. Those of you who know, we've been working through the book of John for over a year now, and last week we dealt with uh, Jesus, this interplay between he and the religious leaders, so much so that he angered them so much that they wanted to stone him, and they tried to grab him, and that's where we left last week. They tried to grab him, and he was able to escape their grasp. Once again, recalling some of his words, it was not yet his time. Because when he finally knew it was his time, or when he finally allowed himself to be taken, he did. But here at this point, he was not going to be stoned. He was not going to be taken. And we come across these last uh, three verses. Jesus goes back across the Jordan. He goes back to the area where he was baptized by John. And there he rallies. There he recharges. There he regroups. There he replenishes his soul before he turns his face back towards Jerusalem to face the cross. So if you have your Bibles, please look with me, please, at chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. And we'll just look at these last three verses, beginning at verse 40. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. He stayed there. And many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we look at three little verses that Perhaps we could skip on and go to the story of Lazarus. It's, it's so more, in, in many of our minds, we have better pictures of that. But Lord, I think that John wrote this from your inspiration for a purpose, for us to look at the time, even when Jesus knew what lay ahead, he stepped back to a familiar place, to a place where he had heard your voice even. And there the people still proclaimed who he was. And there he strengthened himself for what lay ahead, the cross. Today as we think about going back across the Jordan, help us to look at this passage and how it can speak to our hearts even in this year, 2023. This is our prayer, Lord, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we left off last week with the religious leaders. In fact, I tried to explain that to you. Many times it will say the Jews, but he's, it's not some sort of the entire Jewish nation. It's the preachers and the, you know, the priests of the day. It was the rabbinic uh, clergy, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes that are having a problem with Jesus because he's basically identifying with the Father. He says that he and the Father... I and the Father are one. And he's saying that all these things he's done is because of the Father. And they are so angry with him, they're ready to kill him. And he slips off to answer that phone call that I just heard. It's probably my mother's phone. It's okay. Is it my sister's phone? It's mother or sister. I knew that tone. You know, I'm the one who set the tones on those. And they're flip phones, so they take forever to find them, and they lock them away in their, in their purses, so it's okay. They'll be so embarrassed, they'll never come back to church. <laughs> nah, I bring them every week. It's okay, or my wife does. But he's so mad. They're so mad at Jesus. They want to kill him. They want to stone him. Have you ever been so mad that you spit? <laughs> Buddy, you ain't been offended then. Let me... No, but... A couple of questions come to my mind in these three verses. Where was it exactly that he went? And maybe that's just me digging all week long on these three verses. Where did he go exactly? And second to that, why did he go there? Hmm. I mean, he could have hid out in somebody's house. We know that Peter's mother-in-law's mentioned one time, right, in the scriptures. There, there are other people's homes that he's been to. We know <clears throat> in the next chapter, 
He's going to go to the home of Lazarus because Lazarus is sick, and eventually you'll see that he dies, and you know that story, and you're going to hear more about that over the next two or three weeks. But why did he go there, and, and where was it exactly? Well, in John, and that's why this book continues to build, as they all do, but this one especially because we've spent so much time in it over the past year. John 1, verse 28, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Well, you would say, well, that it happened in Bethany. And those of you who have Bible maps, you can look in the back of yours. Mine are actually now, this Bible's starting to fall apart, so I've got a, one of those bulldog clips on it to where those pages don't fall out. But you can look, and as I tried to describe to you earlier, the Sea of Galilee is up here at the top. There's this little snaky 156-mile river that goes uh, between that Sea of Galilee which, and then this Dead Sea down at the bottom, Right? Some of you perhaps have been to Israel, and we've talked about getting a trip there someday, and that would be like a capstone for most preachers to go and most believers to go. But there is a Bethany that he's talking about. What is that? Verse 128, what does it say again? Baptizing. <clears throat> I knew, where was I? I was in 128, wasn't I? That helps when you put your glasses on, Cliff. This all happened at Bethany. There is a Bethany. I, I should have got a map up here for you. There is a Bethany that's further south that's really across the Jordan from Jericho and Jerusalem. And in fact, in John 11, John will say that when Jesus goes back to Lazarus' house, it's just a couple of miles away. But in my mindset... If I'm trying to get away from some people who are going to kill me, I'm going to go probably a, fur, a little further than two miles. And D.A. Carson, who is uh, a biblical scholar, and I owe much of what I bring out on biblical um, commentary from him. He wrote a, I wouldn't say it's comprehensive, but it's called The Gospel of John. It's a book as big as your Bible, just on the book of John, and I have that and some others that I'll go back and forth. He argues that there was another Bethany that was in the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, that going from Aramaic to Greek, that there are multiple ways of spelling that area, that that area was controlled by Philip, the brother or the relative of Herod Antip Antipatus, that's hard for me to say, that he's the one who had John the Baptist beheaded, and this man was a little more tolerant of some of the Jewish practices, or even having a Messiah up there. But this Herod down in the south was very um, paranoid at the time. And I say all that, not that we have to drill down and find exactly where it was, because I doubt many of us will lead any kind of biblical exploration over there or kind of, uh, you know, dig. Uh, but it was more important why he went. If criminals, I'm looking there at Ray Shabilsky, criminals, they say, are known to go back to the scene of the crime, right? I mean, we hear that. I don't know if that's really true, Ray. You may tell me later after church, but we see that on the TV crime shows. Criminal goes back to what he's done or she's done. But I also think it's true in the life of the believer. We all like to go back to the place where we really felt the Spirit of the Lord move us. There's something about going back to your home church the church where you came to know Jesus, perhaps the, the church where you were baptized, maybe the church where you were married. There's something to be said about going home. How many people do you know that spend their whole lives doing certain things in, you know, in their career, and when they finally have the opportunity, they've moved away from home, they move back to their hometown? Now, some of us, I know, some of the older ones, <clears throat> some of us have gone someplace away from their home, Right? And Ed and I were just talking about that. You know, it's, it's fun to go home, but you can't really afford to go and just stay, you know, a whole time. Yeah, so. Um, but it's fun, if you will. It, it is beyond fun. It's, it is refreshing to go back to a place where you felt the presence of God. So Jesus returns to the place where John spoke, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. You remember him saying that in John 1? He's also recalling in his mind, uh, Matthew uh, contains a verse I remember, John, it's Matthew 3, 17, 
When Jesus comes back from being out of the water, from being baptized by John, there, the heavens open up, the dove descends on him, and you hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So he has gone back to the place where John confirmed or affirmed who he was, and he's gone back to the place where his own father spoke aloud for everyone to hear. Jesus is returning back across the Jordan to rally, and that's our first point, rally at Jordan. Now, I know there are all kinds of rallies. There are pep rallies. Yeah, who's I talking? We talked about pep rallies, didn't we? Yeah, last week, I think some of us were talking about that after church, that you know, your team be so bad that even a pep rally was kind of disappointing. We've gone to political rallies. Those of us who like cars, there are auto rallies. It's a little different type of thing. But wherever and whenever the need to gather people to reinvigorate, to recharge, to revive, to recall, to regroup for what lies ahead, there's often a rally. And we even have rally cries. You're in San Antonio. Remember the... If you were from, is it Cuba? Remember the... Chief, oh, who, who got that? Who said Maine? Was that you, Dan Brown? It came back in that direction. Well, somebody, remember, yeah, remember the Maine. Was that you, Cliff? It was a back row Baptist that said it. Okay, it's all right, very good, yeah. Some of you who've read some history in your life, yeah. We use the term rally around the flag, right? You remember after 9-11 and, and the first responders got that flag up on that crane? It was like a rallying point for us. Let's remember who we are and what we're about. And it seems that there's always something to rally around. As the pictures were going through at the beginning of our uh, presentation here, we saw our uh, Filipino missionary, uh, Pastor Rain Fredo, we just call him Rain, who came and spoke at our uh, services. Uh, it's been, I don't know, it's been several months ago. But I got an email from him this morning. Dan, I don't know if you did or not, that his wife was bitten by a rabid dog and uh, having a son who touched a supposedly rabid bat once and rabies shots are just something that everybody wants. Uh, no, not. But uh, Rain has asked for financial support. So if you're interested in, in helping Rain, he says they're like $250 a shot and I think she needs at least three of them. So um, he's asking for help there. But, and I know that people in our congregation will help. But the rally at Jordan had even deeper connections than just an emotional cause. If you have your Bibles, look at Joshua, the third chapter. And I don't want to read the entire uh, chapter to you because you'd actually need to read probably chapter 2 and chapter 4. Isn't it funny? Those of you who taught your kids well, or at least my church background, I have to sing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. <laughs> okay, there it is, where it is, yeah. And when you can't turn to it fast enough. But uh, in Joshua, the third chapter, this is when Joshua has taken the children of Israel. They're about to come out of their years of wandering. They're about to go to the promised land. The spies have come back, and he told them, hey, especially check out Jericho. And the word has come back, hey, man, those guys are shaking in their boots. They know that... The God we serve is powerful, and we're about ready to go on over there and take the promised land. And Joshua tells them in this chapter to go set up camp beside the Jordan River. I think he did. I think I read that. Some of you are like, I didn't get any head nods. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they encamped before crossing over. Verse 15, I think, is very important. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Have you ever been beside rushing water that's so deep that if you jumped in it, it would drown you in a heartbeat? Yeah. That's where he had them wait before they were going to go into their promised land. And I wonder how many times God brings us somewhere and we get to that bank of the Jordan and we feel like we can't make it across. But if you know what happened in this account, it's another Red Sea moment. They dry up the water above them and below them. 
The children walk across on dry land. In fact, he tells them, go back and get 12 rocks. Let's set up a little monument here and, and wait here till it's all set up. And then they go on out and they're ready to take what God has promised them. And I wonder how many times God could bring you through whatever turbulent river storm has happened in your life, but you're afraid to take him by the hand and let him lead you across the Jordan. Now, I have become more of a Johnny Cash fan in my later years. Maybe I like the older Johnny Cash. I, I don't know. Maybe I like the younger Johnny Cash. I wore black here one Sunday, and I remember, I think, Todd, somebody told me, he said, are you Johnny Cash today? I had a black shirt on and black pants. I can't remember. Todd probably wasn't you, but I mean. You know. um, but Johnny Cash and his wife had a song about on the banks of the Jordan. Anybody remember that one at all? Yeah, go Google that. Not during worship. Go Google that sometime today. And it is such a biblical application of the text because many times we think on the other side of the Jordan is heaven. And, and yeah, you can use that symbolism. But he even talks about, as they sang it between, what was her name, June Carter? Yeah, June Carter Cash. They, they echo each other. Whether I get there first or you do, I'll be on the other side of the Jordan. And when I see you coming, I will jump out and run out in the shallow water and grab you by the hand. What wonderful imagery. Jesus has gone back to the other side of the Jordan. I wonder today, are there things in your life that are causing you fear, anxiety, things that you think you cannot overcome, but God can? Crossing the Jordan for the children of Israelites, the, the Israelite children, would be the point that signaled their freedom. It would be the turning point that God was faithful to his promise in the promised land. Jesus rallies at this turning point of his ministry, the beginning of his ministry where John baptized him, announced he's coming, and then the end really of his public ministry because he's getting ready now. You'll notice in the rest of these chapters of the Gospel of John, he's going to the cross. You know, over the years, I've gone to two political rallies ever. In college, and I started to try to research this, and I'm looking at a couple of you. I know, I know exactly how old you are. You know how I am. But I thought, well, if I tell them who it is, they'll think I'm this, de this denomination, this poli politics, whatever. But I did go to, I'm pretty sure, Ronald Reagan rally at my university campus in 1976. Did he not run for the Republican side and not get it in 76. I haven't done all the history. Those of you who are more history buffs than I am, but I went there. And then when I'm in seminary, Jimmy Carter came to the stockyard in Fort Worth. And my seminary buddy said, let's go there. And both times I went hoping to catch the glimpse of a future president. Not so much because I knew anything about their politics. I just knew this is a person that's going to be potentially the most powerful person in the world. And I'd like to go say, I saw him. And I wonder sometimes, attending church is like attending a political rally for some of you. Stay with me. Not concerned about the politics. Only wanting a glimpse of the Savior. Well, our Savior knows your convictions. He knows your actions. He knows your sins. He knows your successes. He knows your politics. And his ministry is transformation, is restoration, and redemption. So you cannot come to a political rally here for Jesus Christ, a rally here, and not expect to be changed. Because if you leave unchanged... You have really been unfaithful to him. Not that the preaching was bad or the music was bad. But you didn't hear what he was trying to say to you. So rally at Jordan with the Savior today. And second and finally, rejoice at Jordan. John 3 mentions that John the Baptist was imprisoned. And the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mention... John's execution, his beheading. You've heard sermons about that and how Herod got all excited about his 
I guess that'd be a stepdaughter, you know, dancing, and she asked for one thing, and it got the head of John the Baptist, who he had in prison. But by the time that we come to John 10, this is the Gospel of John, not John the Baptist, and I know the Johns might confuse you. But Jesus is now gone to John's old hangout, and John the Baptist, most commentators say by this point, has already been executed. And now he rejoices with the words that Jesus said about him. You know, historically, as you read anything about uh, Jewish leaders, uh, they do not often praise anyone who has not done a miraculous deed. So I think it's, it's beautiful that John the Baptist is mentioned once again and even says he didn't do anything miraculous. He did no miracles. But the epitaph that they leave for John is something that you and I should strive for. It says that what he said about this man Jesus was true. How he lived, how he acted, what he did for the Savior was true. And how many times have we failed to even say anything for our Savior? We rejoice at the Jordan because we now have the full, full story that Jesus came, revealed himself, and through his words and his miracles, he's going to go back to Judea, we'll see in chapter 11, and hang on a cross for you and I. We rejoice at the Jordan because of the love and truth of Jesus. Oh yes, we've all sat beside the rushing water and we have perhaps uh, crossed over to the other side. But yet, I want you to think about the footing that Jesus gives you in this life. He grabs you by the hand. I think it's interesting. They put these stones. Anybody familiar enough with Joshua 3? Did they put them in the river? Or did they put them on the bank? Uh-huh. So does it mean I'm standing on the stones as I walk across? I don't know. I think there's more symbolism in there than probably what we'll pull out. But I recently got a photo. It was actually Wednesday night at um, Refuel of my grandsons eating real food. You know, they're like, I don't know, are they almost seven months real soon. And I think at the six-month marker you can eat real food, or I don't know. Don't, don't quote me on this. I am not a medical expert by any means. Any stretch of the means. Can't, in fact, it's been so long since we had babies, I can't even remember it. You know? Isn't it funny how your mind works? I mean, John, I'm looking at you. Do you remember when any of yours were a little bitty? Not really, yeah. yeah. Why? I was working, yeah, and that's often the truth, you know, and she was doing the other work, yeah. But um, Kaylin sent me this picture, and they're both in their little high chairs, and they're reached out like a Michelangelo, and they're touching hands. And they're like grabbing each other's hands and like one's pulling the other one because I don't think either one of them was like what they were getting at the time. I don't know. Maybe that's the night that they got sweet potatoes or something, you know. But we used to love to watch the kids. You know, you feed one of them, I don't know, something nasty and green. They wouldn't eat it and feed them something with some red or whatever. And they would like, oh, yeah. But it is something with grandparents that they love to share the pictures of their children. And I, I don't, grandchildren, I didn't put any up here. And, and parents are the same way. I mean, grandparents will show you pictures of, you know, with food on their face. Parents will probably show you one of maybe somebody in Little League or somebody in dance or, or somebody in their Boy Scout or Girl Scout uniform. And you, you know it. You, you've seen those pictures. You've got them on your phone right now. If I spend some time with you, you probably will want to share them. All. I know, Karen, I'm looking. You've got a new grandbaby. You know, we, we'll share our pictures together. But I've been a pastor and a military chaplain long enough that... Sometimes that parent, that grandparent comes up when you've asked about somebody or perhaps you haven't, and instead of showing you the picture of joy, they whisper in your ear, please, please pray for my son. Please pray for my grandchild, my daughter, my granddaughter, because they have bought land in a foreign country. They have followed the way of the prodigal son because there are prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. And Lift them up to our Lord. Help them get to the other side of the Jordan. And Jesus 
will grab you by the hand and pull you to the other side, no matter what you're in. And there, on the other side of the Jordan, we can rejoice together. Verse 42 says, In that place many rejoiced. Did I get that right? And in that place many people, yeah, believed in Jesus. We're rejoicing. I'm rejoicing because they believed. Rejoice at Jordan. Believe at Jordan. Rally at Jordan. For the words that John spoke of Jesus are true. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, as we come now to a time of invitation, and I know that these three short verses have so much more into them that I can actually pull out. But Lord, we pray that if we're sitting on the bank of the Jordan and we feel that our lives are about to be swept away with the pain and suffering of family trauma, employment, financial, whatever it might be, Lord, remind us that Jesus will pull us to the other side. And there we can rally with him. And there we can rejoice together. Because your words are true. Because what John proclaimed about Jesus was and is the truth. We serve the risen Savior. And I pray today, if there's someone who's never made that statement that I want to believe in Jesus, that during this invitation time, they would so respond and answer your call. Perhaps they want to come to these steps and kneel and pray or stand and pray. We have prayer warriors that will gladly join them at their side and pray with them together. Lord, let your Holy Spirit flow. Let us respond to your call. For we hear your voice. You are the good shepherd and we are your sheep. Hear this prayer we ask in Christ's name. Amen.